This episode of the Beauté by ABIC podcast is brought to you by the Aesthetic and Beauty Industry Council. Hello and welcome to the Beauté by ABIC podcast, your online support community for the aesthetic and beauty industry. Here, we are strengthening and unifying the industry through representation, innovation and education. This is a platform created and dedicated to the aesthetic and beauty industry, valuing unity and advancement. We serve to represent, support and inspire you by connecting you with industry experts, expanding your knowledge through educational pieces and bringing you the latest industry news. This is Beauté by ABIC. Welcome, I'm your host, Stephanie Miller, and today's guest is Fiona Tuck from Vitasol. Fiona is an author, nutritional medicine practitioner, and skin therapist with over 30 years' experience in the professional skincare industry. Her experience ranges from practitioner, clinic owner, educator, and product development and media commentator. She is the host of the Forensic Nutritionist podcast and one of Australia's most televised skin and nutrition experts. Fiona is also the founder of Vitasol, the leading Australian skin professional nutraceutical brand supporting skin health from inside out. Here to discuss the controversial topic of professional skincare myths and marketing claims from Vitasol, today we welcome Fiona Tuck. Welcome to the podcast, Fiona. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I know we've got some really great information to discuss this morning, so I'm really (laughs) excited. We certainly have, and it's a real pleasure having you today. Um, Many of our listeners will already know who you are. For those that are hearing you today for the first time, can you please share with us how you actually came to be in the beauty and aesthetic industry? Gosh, well, I've always worked in this industry so I've been in the industry for it's over 30 years now I absolutely love it with a passion Um, worked in a variety of different roles so my background is skincare I've worked in you know as a business owner I've worked as a dermal therapy trainer I've worked in product education product formulation. I also have a nutritional background as well, so nutritional medicine. And so over the years, yes, I've worked with many of the um, top skincare brands as well and absolutely love it with a passion. So for me, it's always about learning and evolving. At the moment, um, what I'm doing is more on the training side. And of course, I've got the Vitasol products, which are professional use skincare clinic nutraceuticals so providing products for internal skin support oh that's beautiful gosh you've had such a wide array of experience in the industry it's um yeah from skincare all the way to nutraceuticals and and in between that's fantastic so we're very privileged to have you on today um today we're actually talking about something very fun but yet frank uh, we're talking about skincare myths and marketing claims. So how about we dive right in? What is a what do you believe is a misleading marketing claim? It's such um a huge topic. And I think the thing to understand is that in the professional skincare industry, I think we really need to understand the difference between evidence based and misleading marketing and I think you know even just starting at the very basics between understanding the difference between a cosmetic and a cosmeceutical you know many skin therapists will be talking about well you know the products that we sell are different than the products that you will could get in a department store they're just cosmetic products and I think you know let's be frank here and let's be real a cosmeceutical there is no actual definition if you like a cosmeceutical is a cosmetic it falls under a cosmetic so if we are selling a skincare product whether it be in a department store or via a skincare clinic it is still classified as a cosmetic we tend to call them cosmeceuticals 
because we know that they do contain active ingredients or functional ingredients, but there is no law or governing body to say that a product is more active if it is sold by a skin professional. Mm. The difference really is that skin professionals hopefully are, are qualified and understand how to recommend a product for a different skin but you could buy a cosmeceutical in a department store or in a supermarket. And that's what I think people need to understand. So I think let's get really real and frank here as to when we're talking to our clients, we really need to understand what we're actually talking about and understand ingredients. And I think quite often, you know, I hear time and time again, therapists say, well, you can't get a good product from a department store, but then there are dermatologists only, doctor only, marketing products that are now available through the department stores Mm. so I think you know this is a lot of misleading marketing and and stuff like that we need to call out so marketing what misleading lots of things you know doctor only products well is that misleading because it would lead a consumer to believe that those products are medical grade what does that actually mean well it doesn't actually mean anything so in a way you could say that's misleading marketing because it technically is classified as a cosmetic Mm, as long as we know i suppose they're used more in in a descriptive term uh cosmeceutical to outline the fact that they're prescribed usually by skincare professionals if we use them in a descriptive way rather than a prescriptive way or a um, as an identifier, does that make it different? I think it's about how we explain it to the consumer because let's face it, a supermarket sells cosmeceuticals. There's niacinamide, there's hydroxy acids available in the, in the supermarket. So I think a cosmeceutical, when we're talking about them, we're really just differentiating the fact that we do have some ingredients that may have peer-reviewed evidence to support that they are functional ingredients. Mm, Being in the skincare industry, you know, I suppose, global brands and brands that tend to place their products in department stores, they do differ slightly in the way that they, the actual product company puts them together in terms of active ingredients and so forth. We know global brands tend to, you know, pare it down a little bit because they're scared of adverse events or things like that. Um, what do you think about, you know, the ingredients kind of between the two, uh, the active ingredients and the percentages? Steph, it all comes down to marketing, right? Because even if you're looking at things like azelaic acid, you know, the evidence that azelaic acid is for results 15 to 20%, that is a prescription only product. And we now know that azelaic acid is a pharmacy only product. So really, when we say pharmacy products, you know, you buy medicine from a pharmacy. So you can't say a pharmacy product would have less active ingredients. It literally comes down to marketing. So as a lay, it really should only be bought through as it stands at the moment in Australia. And it, it does change um, with the TGA. But um, at the moment, it, it's only, it, it can't be bought unless you buy it through a pharmacy or again, if it's prescribed by a dermatologist. So And again, with the active ingredients, there are active ingredient guidelines. So there are safety percentages that a skincare company can use their ingredients in, and there are guidelines of that. So when it comes down to active ingredients, we need to be careful because it really depends on what an ingredient is mixed with as to how active it will be. So we can add some ingredients and it will become more active. You can add other ingredients and it will become less active um but ultimately you know i think sometimes there can be misleading marketing on percentage claims as well because Mm -hmm. percentage as you well know doesn't mean to say that makes the product better it may make it more active but that may also make it more irritating so let's talk about say niacinamide for instance where that therapeutic evidence lies is around four to five percent niacinamide So when we go above that, the chances of irritation greatly increase on the skin. So there is no evidence for better results above that therapeutic amount, but there are still brands that are recommending 10, 20% niacinamide, which really is coming back down to marketing, you know, the more the better, 
we're stronger and better. And that comes down to, in my opinion, misleading marketing because the evidence isn't there to support that high amount. It's it, the evidence is is between sort of four to five to six percent niacinamide. So to put it any higher amount really is only going to increase the risk of skin irritation. That's the same with, uh, with certain types of vitamins as well, mega dosing vitamins um, and claiming efficacy for higher ingredients, for a higher percentage of ingredients. Absolutely. So the same will go with um, vitamin ingredients, with vitamin C. I know retinol, for instance, that the, um, the cap on retinol is 1%, but Sometimes brands will say, well, it's in a retinal complex and it's at 2%. So people think it's stronger when it's not. How ingredients are marketed is quite misleading. Stronger is not better. It just means more increased risk of irritation. And I think it comes down to is that brand promoting evidence-based therapeutics or higher is better? And that is when it gets misleading. And the big brands, the really big brands, which are available, they've got all sorts of different brands. You know, the, they'll have the professional skin clinic brands and they'll have supermarket brands, but they will always work within scope because they have much stricter, I guess, um, they're more concerned or they're more aware, if you like, whereas more the indie brands may not be so aware of that and they'll just be promoting it more is better. Of course, as we know as well, you could have a, a really high percent of hydroxy acid, which is going to be more irritating than a lower percent. But then again, the pH also will vary too. So a brand may promote a high percent of hydroxy acid, but if the pH is higher, it won't be so irritating, but people think they've got a stronger product. So there's a lot that goes on in the industry, um, <laughs> which is coming down to marketing and I think, unfortunately, because it is such a competitive industry that now to sort of make noise in this space, you know, a lot of brands are saying we've got the highest percent. And I think as therapists, that's not necessarily a good thing. And we need to understand that too strong a product can create barrier disruption and potential skin sensitivity and dehydration. And now we see all these brands bringing out sort of skin ranges because they've been using too many actives and, and too strong a product. So stronger isn't always better. And I, I think that's an important fact to realise. I think there's starting to become a little bit of an understanding throughout the industry that stronger isn't necessarily better and, and ingredients, some ingredients in symbiotic um, use are actually more effective than single dose, you know, really high percentage ingredients. But tell us a little bit about free from claims. Uh, why do you believe that these are the most leading of all? Well, free from claims are allowed in Australia, but in the EU they're actually banned, and that is because they are seen as misleading or untruthful. So mm -hmm. to claim a product free from could, in most situations, imply that that ingredient is detrimental. And... The ingredients that are used in cosmetics are all, they all go through, you know, regulations of how much can be used, for instance. And so they're not toxic. So if a brand would claim free from toxic ingredients, for instance, that's a misleading claim because we're not allowed to use toxic ingredients in skincare. So I think it's important to understand that. And I think the free from claims are implying that, well, we don't have this, which means this ingredient is potentially irritating or toxic. And so that actually has been banned in the EU because it is potentially misleading. If it's in the case of an allergen, for instance, so if somebody has got a fragrance allergy and the brand is said free from artificial fragrance, well, that's okay because that person may need to know that it, it's got no artificial fragrance in because they may have a sensitivity to it. But if a brand puts fragrance free but still includes essential oils, that's actually a misleading claim because it still has a fragrance. So I think the free from claims, if you're putting it in there to let somebody know because of an allergy, then that's different. But if you're actually saying free from to imply that these ingredients are 
dangerous, for instance, we need to be careful. So free from what I'm seeing at the moment, free from preservatives. Mm, Tell us a bit about that because that's very contentious right now. Well, I think the thing with preservatives, we need to understand that preservatives are in there to prevent microbial growth within a skincare product. If that product grows um, or become, uh, grows microbes or becomes contaminated, it can be exceptionally dangerous, really, really dangerous. And so, of course, all products have to go through microbial testing to prove that they're not contaminated. And there have been cases actually recently of products that have been free from preservatives that have become contaminated with fungus and all sorts of issues, mold issues, mm. and have had to be completely recalled because they didn't have preservative systems. So preservative systems are very important. But because people are becoming more aware of things like the skin microbiome and the skin barrier function, we're now seeing this shift towards preservative free but I think you need to understand that a preservative in a skincare product is preventing the growth of microbes in a product it is not an antiseptic that is wiping out microbes on the skin you know it doesn't function like that so that's important to understand where it's misleading is that a company could choose not to use a preservative as in what is called a preservative like phenoxyethanol for instance But they could choose antimicrobial ingredients such as alcohol, ethanol. There are other ingredients as well that in combination can have antimicrobial benefits. So you don't have to add a actual named preservative, but those ingredients are working collectively in that product to have antimicrobial benefits. So if a product company then claimed anti uh, free from preservatives but it has still got antimicrobials that is very misleading and that's potentially you know that's something that the ACCC could be looking into and that they could get into trouble because if it's got ethanol in there and that ethanol is working as an antimicrobial you can't say it's free from preservatives so I think that's something that's very misleading and I think we'll be seeing more of that now as brands are looking for the next marketing thing to promote there are some products that can be free from preservatives so if it is an oil-based product then um, it doesn't you know if it's got minimum amount of water in it then it may not need a preservative Mm -hmm. or if it's got a very low ph or a very high ph then it may not need a preservative either Um, so not every single product will need a preservative and there are ways of formulating without preservatives but there are some products there that have antimicrobials in them but they're claiming preservative free and that is very very misleading information all very true and very interesting let's move on to the inky list so tell us for starters those who don't know what an inky list is what is an inky list and why can't you tell much about a product simply by looking at this inky list yeah, this is a great one. Well, I mean, the ink list is the ingredients and how they have to be listed on the back of a label. And I think this is where skin therapists can get a little bit confused because they'll pick up a product, they'll see a label. I've seen them do this time and time again and they'll go, oh, it's got water as the first ingredient, so it's diluted. <laughs> or they'll be looking at it, which isn't true, by the way, because often you need water oh, cool. as a, a solvent or a carrier. Um, you know, I, I think skin therapists think that you need to have an ingredient in 100% for it to be active, yet we know that things like peptides will be in 1% or less to be active. So I don't think they understand how much of a percent needs to be in there to be effective. But the inky list, um, products have to be listed in their percentage. However, once you get to 1% or below, ingredients can be listed in any order. So for a therapist to look on there and say, oh, well, this is high up or this is low down, it can be misleading because you don't necessarily know where that 1%. So that can make it misleading. You also don't know. So for instance, let's just say somebody looked at the inky list and saw sulfate on there. They could go, oh, my God sulfates it's got sulfates it's going to really dry the skin out and we know that high amounts of sulfates may potentially have a drying effect on the skin um, in a form of a surfactant but 
it's the final combination of the product and the ingredients. So other ingredients can be added to make it more mild so that it is not drying. So you really need to understand formulas to be able to work out whether that ingredient is going to be potentially problematic or not. The same for all ingredients, really. So some ingredients will work in synergy together. So you could combine ingredients to make them more potent so you won't need such a high amount and that's where it can get misleading or you can have an ingredient that could be potentially irritating on its own but when mixed with other ingredients it's then very gentle on the skin and so if a therapist just has heard about one ingredient and they think it's bad or good that could be misleading also thinking about things like lactic acid well that could be in there um, depending on the ph as an exfoliant as a hydroxy acid or it could be in there as a hydrator so again um, they really need to understand the ingredients and what they're in for in there for the other thing of course as well is in australia the the list isn't as strict as in the eu so it really depends if the label requirement is an Australian label or has that company listed the ingredient as according to EU standards Mm -hmm. and if it's according to EU standards it's a lot more strict so every single ingredient has to be listed with EU standards so let's say you had a raw ingredient let's say it was niacinamide for instance but that came with a paraben and uh, propylene glycol now in australia you may not have to list the propylene glycol and the paraben but in the eu you would so it depends on how a company chooses to label their ingredients you may go i don't want that product because it's got propylene glycol whereas your product may have it but it's just not been listed because it's australian listing whereas you may be looking at a eu list Um, So it's all really quite confusing. So my point being, um, you can tell what's in a product with the list and you can get a good idea. So if somebody has got an allergy to a certain ingredient, then of course you can tell by looking at the list. But you can't necessarily get an idea of how active or how effective a product will be just by looking at that ingredient list. The Aesthetic and Beauty Industry Council is Australia's peak industry body, representing the collective professional beauty and aesthetic salon, clinic and spa community. Created for the industry, by the industry, our council is a collaboration of industry leaders who bring their commitment and specialised skills to raise industry standards, guide regulation and be a strong voice to government. At ABIC, our purpose is to provide an accessible and supportive organisation for the betterment of the professional beauty and aesthetic field, to enhance working practices and promote unity across the various sectors of the industry. ABIC's mission also includes being a trusted source of referral, education and guidance for clients of the beauty and aesthetic profession. ABIC is here to support our members through an extensive offering, including hundreds of valuable resources, HR support and industry expert facilitators to ensure your continued growth and success. Join us today and together let's safeguard the future of the beauty and aesthetic industry. Find us at www.theabic.org.au. At ABIC, we are here for you. And for those who probably missed what Fiona was talking about, she was talking about the raw ingredients. So when the actual product company buys the raw ingredients, there could be other ingredients simultaneously within that raw. Those don't have to be listed. In Australia, they don't, but in the EU, they do. They do, yes. Um, and so, you know, let, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, there, there's always been a lot of talk about comedogenic products, you know, and uh, ingredients. Tell us a little bit about that um, and what ingredients really are and what aren't. Yeah, this is a really interesting one because I think, again, scaremongering, comedogenic ingredients. First of all, I think it's important to understand that in order for a, a skincare ingredient to be comedogenic, as in it may encourage 
blackheads or breakouts in the skin, it needs to be used, first of all, on a skin that is prone to slower cell turnover or retention hyperkeratosis. So in other words, if a skin has got a slower cell turnover or retains more skin cells, then it will be more prone to congestion, you know, in the case of acne, for instance. And for an ingredient to be deemed comedogenic, it really needs to be able to enter into the hair follicle and cause buildup or worsen that retention of skin cells so that's really important to know because it means that some products or ingredients will or some skins will be more prone to breakouts than others from certain ingredients and so if you are more prone to an oily sort of acne skin then you definitely will be more prone to comedogenic ingredients whereas a a dry skin may not Um, so that's important to understand But really, you know, as I said, for an ingredient to be comedogenic, it must be able to penetrate into the hair follicle and cause retention hyperkeratosis. So, you know, things that we commonly think or have been told in the past about ingredients causing congestion isn't necessarily true. So a classic example in the professional skincare industry is silicones. You know, people freak out about silicones and they say, oh, you mustn't use them, they're comedogenic. Well, Silicones, they don't penetrate into the hair follicle. They have um, been shown to be completely non-comedogenic. So I think that's a myth that does need to be busted. And in fact, in the medical arena, silicones are often used, especially on scar tissue, because of their ability to help with skin barrier function and help to prevent transepidermal moisture loss. So Silicones can actually be really beneficial in skincare, which is quite a controversial thing to say, but they can be quite beneficial. The the bad rap with silicones is really because they often get mixed in with comedogenic ingredients. And so somebody may be using a product that's causing breakout that has got things like a myrostate ester. So isopropyl myrostate can be comedogenic and it gives the same sort of slip and feel and glide mm. sensation as a silicone. But isopropyl myrostate can get into the hair follicle and cause irritation and can cause breakouts. And you tend to find that in rich moisturizers, but mainly in those more sort of luxury department store type products. But it also tends to be in makeups. So again, we know things like artificial colors and dyes, particularly those DNC reds can be quite comedogenic. So if you've got that with an isopropyl myrostate, then that might be aggravating breakouts in some skin. So that's Mm. important to know. But then, of course, we've got other comedogenic ingredients like coconut oil and cocoa butter, and they can be quite, even avocado oil, they can be quite comedogenic and hydrogenated oils as well. But again, it depends on how much of that product or how much of that ingredient is in the product. how many different comedogenic ingredients are mixed together because that will increase the risk. Is it a leave-on product like a makeup or a moisturiser or is it a wash-off? Because if it's a wash-off, it's not likely to be causing any products. And does it have, say, something like an exfoliant added to it because then it's not likely to be comedogenic because it's encouraging um, that desquamation process so you're not getting that retention hyperkeratosis. So... Again, it's not as simple as looking at an ingredient list and saying, oh, my God, you know, that's really bad. It might be, but it might have other ingredients blended with it. So coconut oil, for instance, we know is really comedogenic. However, it could be sort of a fractionated coconut oil that is non-comedogenic because it's had other chemical processes so that it's not comedogenic anymore. So, again, it can be quite misleading just looking at the inky list. It really comes down to the individual formula. Even vitamin E to caferol can be comedogenic. So ultimately it depends on how much is in the formula, what form of to caferol is used. So what's the grade of to caferol used? Is it mixed with other comedogenic ingredients or is it in its um, acetate form, which isn't comedogenic so 
again, I think when we make these grand sweeping claims to our clients and don't use that because it's got this, this and this in it, we really need to understand how that may vary depending on the skin and depending on the formulation. That was extremely beneficial. Thank you so much for explaining all of that. Fiona, I've got a final question for you, and that's you're often called the myth buster, <laughs> which, is, which is fantastic. But um, what actually drew you to talking about this quite openly? And what actually qualifies you as well to be talking about, you know, misleading claims and so forth? Well, I think for me, it's just sort of working in the industry, having a lot of experience in that formulation side of things. I've done a lot of media, so I used to do quite a bit on television as well. And somehow it just developed over time as to myth busting. Um, I find the media always like to know what's the truth on this and where do we stand on this? And this is how it's just evolved and how it's grown because in media, it's very much about they love attention-grabbing headlines, they love mm. the scaremongering, and that's how most brands choose to sell. They sell on what their their products don't do or don't contain rather on, than on the ingredients that they do have. And over time, and because there have been things like um, with the wellness era and we have had people that have been claiming things about food that hasn't been true and then we've been having, you know, all this clean beauty movement and claiming toxic ingredients that aren't necessarily true. The media now is moving towards very much evidence-based information and you now see that they're very much about looking at um, talking to qualified experts that can actually decipher through the evidence to find out what is real and what is what is fake news if you like and I think that is where we are going and I think with COVID you know it moved away from all the the scaremongering marketing and now we're actually wanting to get to you know well what does the science say on that what does the evidence say on that where do we stand on that and I think this is what as skin professionals we need to be doing we need to be saying well what is the evidence on that what what is the evidence of the therapeutic recommended amount for that skincare ingredients where do we stand on that we need to be more critical in our thinking rather than just say well our ingredient is better because we've got more of it or our product is better because we don't use parabens um there's no evidence for any of that. And I think it's important that we really get to the truth. And that's what, what my passion is. It's about being the best possible skin therapist we can be, giving the right education to our clients. And remember that the consumer now is so educated. There are There is so much education online. And yes, there are influencers that are providing incorrect information, but there are also PhD experts that are providing the right information. And quite frankly, that information often conflicts what we have been taught as dermal therapists and skin therapists. It happens for sure. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people um, will trail the emergence of transparency and clean beauty and all of that to an era where they the consumer felt like they weren't being told certain things and they weren't feeling in control of their um, their choices and so I suppose that was a very strong push in one direction because the consumer felt misled uh, about a lot of things and that's when I think clean beauty and um the movement again on transparency, which I, I totally believe, you know, still should be the case. You know, complete transparency in what in what a brand does, so that a person can have choice. Because I believe that that is what possibly was lacking before. Now the pendulum has swung the other way, and what it, it did actually for a while, and I think now it's coming back to more middle ground. So um, that's usually when a shift happens. To get to the truth of transparency, yes. you know, it, there was a problem, you know, aggressive clean beauty and aggressive transparency and all of that came in to counteract that problem and then possibly got a little bit out of hand and now the pendulum is swinging back to a more um, middle base ground uh, level where we can say, look, 
you know, it is important to be to, to source your, your ingredients consciously. It is important for a brand to be able to not blindly, um, you know, just go ahead and choose what they're given. I think it is about choice and it is about getting the consumer to understand in the end what they can choose, uh, knowing all the facts. I think it is about choice. You know, there are certain ingredients that I personally don't like in skincare, but, mm. um, and I may choose to avoid them. You know, for me personally, I don't like artificial fragrance in skincare and I don't like certain ingredients like propylene glycol. That's just me. I'm not here to say they are dangerous in any way. And that's the thing, you know, with artificial fragrance. Yeah, I don't like it. I personally avoid skincare products with artificial fragrance, but let's be honest. Most essential oils are far more irritating <laughs> than artificial fragrance and that's where the truth is and that's where we need to be realistic. So if we're saying to a client, stop using that product because it's got artificial fragrance and they're loving it and it's not causing a problem and we're saying, you know, it's really irritating to the skin and they're not getting irritation, that's not necessarily true if they're actually also selling a product that's really high in essential oils. I love essential oils personally and I don't have an issue with them on my skin but it's all about as you said finding that middle ground and it does come down to choice there are ingredients that some people find don't work well on their skin and it's different for everyone but I think my point is let's come from a place of truth and transparency yeah. let's provide the right education Let's not be recommending a product to a client on scaremongering. That, in my opinion, is misleading. Mm. And unfortunately, the professional skincare industry is a very big culprit for scaremongering on ingredients without giving the full picture. Um, you know, don't use this ingredient because it's got pegs in it. Even with the, the peg story as well, a lot of people say pegs are dangerous because they um, produce a chemical called 1,4-dioxane, I think it is. But um, the pegs that are used in cosmetic chemistry do not allow the 1,4-dioxane. That's more in industrial situations. So, again, do you see what I'm saying? It's misleading information. If anything, some pegs are used to make a, a product more gentle. Now, I'm not saying we all should be using products with pegs in it. I'm just saying to scaremonger somebody to say something is bad when it's actually not quite true is untruthful and misleading. Can you tell us a little bit about what changes are looming in the um, marketing world for skincare? Well, just my gut feeling is I think because there are so many new products coming out and I think with ingestibles as well, you know, there's hair supplements, there's um, topical products as well um, for skincare and some quite grand claims that are coming out. I do feel that there will be a shift and there will be much stricter regulation. So currently with any skincare product, including professional skincare product, we cannot make therapeutic claims. And at the moment, that isn't being adhered to. And most companies aren't compliant with that and they do make therapeutic claims. So that then gets passed on to the therapist and the therapist then makes therapeutic claims. And that's where I think the, the regulations will tighten up. So as a, a skincare company, most skincare companies will teach how their products and how their ingredients work. And they will be teaching how their ingredients work at a cellular level because they want the therapist to understand how great their ingredients are. And there's nothing wrong with that. However, where that gets jumbled is that the therapist will then take that information and use that to market their product in um, to the consumer, and whether that be on their website or whether that be on social media. So, for instance, we can say in training, because we're not marketing or advertising the product as a tyrosinase inhibitor, we can say how this product works on melanin and, and tyrosinase, etc. But you can't on a website to the public claim that your product works at a cellular level with cell communication, inhibiting 
melanin synthesis and, and acts as a tyrosinase inhibitor. That is a therapeutic claim and companies aren't allowed to do that. Therapists, on, you know, on your website, you've got to be really, really careful. You can't say this product cures acne. And we're already seeing with the TGA tightening up their advertising rules on both supplements and topical skincare and therapeutic claims. So I think the first thing will be therapeutic claims. We can't use testimonies that are making therapeutic claims. We can only promote a product or advertise a product as to how it will improve the appearance of the skin. Mm. It's a very, very grey area, Steph, and most companies, it's hard because it's competitive as well and companies need to be able to say how great their ingredients are, but they can't actually promote ingredients that are tested in vitro. They can only promote in vivo testing, which means human trials. So, again, if it's making a therapeutic claim, they can't do that but they can promote this visibly improve the appearance of um, the skin. Um, It's all come down to wording. If you put the appearance in there, you can pretty much (laughs) promote anything. Um, So it it does get a little bit silly in a way because it's like, oh, this is getting really pedantic. But I do think um, because there are so many influencers now saying this product cured my acne, this cured my eczema, this made my hair grow and cured my alopecia. You know, they're all therapeutic claims and we can't make those claims. So it's just being a little bit more careful on wording, I guess, and implying uh, publicly what your products can and can't do. And that is where I think um, both the ACCC and the TGA will start to really come down hard. So if a brand, for instance, on their website is making claims at a cellular level, collagen induction, for instance, you know, the new um, skin, those little skin micro-needling patches that some brands are recommending, they're claiming to penetrate the skin. So with a cosmeceutical, which is technically a cosmetic, we can't claim skin penetration. They're only to be used topically on the skin. So I think there are still some very grey areas, including what can be used with skin needling devices as well because technically if anything is penetrating the skin then it should be registered as a drug so i think there's going to be some changes and i think these things are going to come under the microscope in the near future wow what a very meaty discussion today um (laughs) (laughs) thank you so much for your honesty and um coming on and telling us your opinions uh you know it's always for the good is always so that we can um, improve, get better and, and protect our industry. You're most welcome. I think ultimately it is about protecting the therapists, knowing what they can and can't be saying. It's about protecting brands because a lot of them don't realise what they can and can't be saying as well. And um, it's really just sort of tightening all these areas up and just it's really getting good with your wording, to be quite honest with you, and just not making really out there statements that Mm -hmm. that can't be backed up without evidence. Absolutely. It is about protecting the therapists and the brands as well. You know, it's all coming from a place of wanting to improve and advance our industry, and that's what AVIC is about, improving and advancing our industry and having these, um, you know, very frank, and honest discussions and getting all different people's opinions as well. Um, it's really good to hear from a diverse sector of the industry, not just having people always agree and, and you know, concur with everything that's going on. I think healthy debate is, is great. So, yeah, thank you so much. Love to have you back on again, Fiona. Uh, it was a fantastic discussion. You're welcome. It's always a pleasure to chat with you. You've reached the end of another episode of the Beauté by ABIC podcast, your online support community for the aesthetic and beauty industry. Thank you for listening. And until next time, stay connected.